Let's open with a word of prayer. We'll begin. Father, we pray for this church, Lord God. We pray that you bless it mightily. God, we're looking for what you have in store for us, not what the world tells us we need, not for what people think per se. We value people, Lord God, but we want to know the direction you're guiding us. I believe that you're leading us to teach and empower people, Lord God, but we want to be effective. So tonight, Lord, I pray for each and every person in this house that the Spirit of God become mighty in their life, that it would be a tangible source of life that it would touch their hearts, that it would fill their bodies, Lord God, and erase every debt of sin and anything that's holding them back, Lord God. Today, we're looking for chains to be broken. We're looking to liberate people from their past and who they are, Lord God, but to equip them to be mighty, not just in word, but in deed and in the power of the kingdom of Christ. Lord, we pray the power of God touch everybody. Give them ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to understand, Lord God, so they may be healed of anything that has been needed. Thank you, Lord God, for a wonderful place. We bless this ministry and the house for Little Meadows as they've allowed us to minister. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Uh, so tonight, of course, uh, we want to pick up where we left off. Uh, last week was uh, Easter Sunday. Hope everybody had a great Easter Resurrection Sunday, vacation, day off. I have Friday off. Some people maybe not have. I did. It was great. And uh, we're back to work tomorrow. But I think after today you'll be encouraged in a variety of ways. But uh, if you remember last week, we talked a little bit about uh, the ministry of reconciliation. It was in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And the week before that, I know I'm going to be digging deep here. We talked about Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 1. I know that might be hard to remember. One thing I want to remind everybody, we're putting all our sermons on YouTube. So they're there in case you ever miss a week. And you feel like, okay, Mike is referencing something that I wasn't there for, that doesn't help. Please feel free to uh, take a look at that. It's there. It's on ncgabby.org. Because I'm going to be borrowing a lot of those to put today. Because remember, I finished last week, I said this week we're going to talk about ministry. I've been telling everybody, you guys are ministers. You have the ministry of Jesus Christ in you. You're called to go out and preach the gospel. And so we as a church want to equip that. So we'll get started. Today we're going to start with a very Sunday school-like lesson, but it's okay. I have here a flashlight. Everybody can see. Simple enough. Now, this is my sermon, and you're like, why did I drive here? <laughs> now, everybody knows what this does. It shines light. Whether I call it a flashlight, whether I call it the anointed flashlight, whether I call it the apostle flashlight, it has a purpose, right? It can be called whatever. It's a flashlight. It does what it's supposed to shine light. If I call this a chair, it doesn't change its purpose. If I call it Christian, it doesn't change purpose. It has a purpose that's been designed, right? When I built this, it has a purpose. Simple as that, right? That's what we're going to talk today. We're going to talk about God's design purpose in each of you when he saved you, when he remade you new. Remember, 2 Corinthians 5 said he made you new, all things have passed away. So there was something designed in each of you, a purpose that was given. This has a purpose. It's a flashlight. Now, whether I call it one thing or another, it doesn't change its purpose. Now, if I turn it on, nothing's happening. What am I missing? Battery. Ah. See, what you need is a battery like this. <laughs> this is power, brother. This is power. This is needed. This won't work without a battery. Okay? Now, this is a pretty sizable battery. Now, you know you're anointed when you carry this kind of battery. And basically, this connects to this. If I have power of God, if I carry the power of God in my preaching, like Paul says, and just sitting here, does that do anything by itself? No. If a battery is just sitting here, and I tell everybody, look at the size of my battery. Look at it. It's amazing. It doesn't have an effect. Right? So what we've been doing these past few weeks, we talked about the resurrection power of Christ, if you remember. Ephesians chapter 3 said that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or, you remember? Think. Thank you. Oh, somebody listen. So, but what we think, according to the power that works in us. What was that power? Ephesians chapter 1 said, the same power that resurrects Christ, which is an exceedingly great power, is the same power that raises us. And Romans 8 chapter 11 says that same power works in us now. So, the exceeding power and greatness of Christ that raised a dead man from the cross, they buried and killed him brutally, says we have power. Now, you say, why the flashlight? What's all this charade for? We'll get to that. Okay, so simple analogy, we have the power of Christ, we have a ministry calling. Okay? If you don't remember this, it's going to make sense in a minute. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 together. Matthew chapter 5. 
I'll have it up on the screen for me. Thank you, sir. We're going to read together Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now you see where we're headed. I told you you're all called as ministers. We ministered our job site. We may minister at a grocery store if someone begins to say they're in pain. What I want to show you tonight is how to begin this ministry that God has given you. Because it tells me that God is speaking to everybody here. We're not talking pastors here anymore. We're not talking about a seminary student. Jesus was talking to a multitude and also his disciples and said, You are, everybody here, the light of the world. Is that fair? You are the light of the world. Let your, shine, let your light shine before men. Now, I told you the past two weeks, I'll show you how to equip yourself with the power of God. And so right now, we're going to show you the next step as to what it is to shine your light on people. How does that work? Can it be better than what I've seen? I'm not saying this verse may be new to many of you, but I want to enhance it. I want to put the touch of the Holy Spirit upon it so that you can see just how far that goes. So I want to share with you the very first point tonight. Now, if you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about identity. And your identity in Christ enables you to be like Christ. The more you understand who Jesus Christ is, how he's a glorified Son of God, if you remember I talked about Colossians saying he's the very image of God, the more you understand him, the more you can be like him. The more you understand how he operated, the more you can operate like Christ. So we, Jesus told us, you are the light of the world. Well, let's look at a verse, we'll click it together. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. Now we, he said, you are the light of the world. Now let's look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message which we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So where am I going? God said you are the light, right? Jesus said you are the light. That tells me that God is also light. Okay, we're talking about identity first. I know we talked about that before. We're going to put a foundation here before we start ministry. Just a quick foundation of who you really are in God's eyes. So God said I'm light, but he called you like. Does he stop there? No. John chapter 1, verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Now, capital L, when I say not that light, capital L. That was a true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. So this verse says that John the Baptist was about to precede the very Son of God. That John, Jesus was about to come in man form. He said, I'm not that guy, but Jesus is that light. So the first of all, Jesus told you, you're the light of the world. Then we see in the Bible that God is light. And here we see that Jesus is light. We're going to start to see a very divine connection of who you are. One more verse that makes it really clear. John chapter 8, verse 12. I know I'm throwing a few verses at you, but it's okay. John chapter 8, verse 12 says, Then Jesus, this time it's Jesus, spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So Jesus said, I'm the light. we got a lot of confused people, I guess. Jesus said, now I'm the light. God said, I'm light. And he said, you're a light. Is it confusion? Or is he trying to change who you are? Does he want to see who you really are in God's eyes? You remember I told you in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, God made man in the image of him. And in the image of him, God created man. Remember I said it said the same thing twice? Do you realize how far God went with that? When God first made you, he wanted you to be like him. That was actually the plan. I'm not bending scripture for anybody. I'm telling you that God really wanted you to be like him. Of course, we all know the story about Adam. He took of the forbidden fruit, him and Eve. We can blame Eve, but it didn't go so well for Adam. <laughs> so I don't suggest trying that. But we lost it. We lost that dominion that we had, and we gave it to the devil. Now, when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he did one thing. Well, many things. But one thing he did was he gave it back to us. 
And to restore that relationship with God, he called you, you are the light. So when he said you are the light, he was showing you that, hey, not only am I coming to redeem your sin, I'm actually putting you back in the Father's house. I'm bringing you back into restoration with God. Does that make sense? So one thing you have to see when you begin to operate in a ministry of reconciliation, remember last week, 2 Corinthians 5, you are ambassadors of Christ. You represent God in this world. One of the ways we're going to show you how to represent God is for you to begin to see who you are in the mirror. And the first thing you have to recognize is God called you the same name he calls himself. Now he says he's capital L, light, but he calls you light. So there's something special. God really loves you. You have to believe that God loves you enough to equip you with his own name. That's crazy, right? God says, I'm light, but he says, you're light. That's amazing. So when we begin to show you how to minister, one of your resource pools, as we can call it, is that God sees me as himself in a sense. Not saying that I'm God, but I'm God's representation. Right? But he doesn't give you like the short stick. He doesn't give you second class. He says, you're also light. You're a light. It's amazing to me. And the more you see this, you'll see this whole idea of you being light is actually spoken of throughout the New Testament. Now, I don't want to keep shoving verses at you, but I'll tell you very quickly that in Ephesians 5, Philippians 2, and 1 Thessalonians 5, I'm not giving you the verse, they all call you light. He calls you your children of light. And so throughout the epistles and the rest of the New Testament, God continues to call you, you're a child of light. You're a child of light. You're a child of light. So you have to recognize when you begin to minister that you're not just running out there on your own. You're not just trying to minister hoping that God may bail you out and maybe when you pray for somebody that it will work for you. You have to have confidence that God has already changed you. He changed your identity. He changed the way he sees you. He changed the way he hears you. And you should change the way you pray. I'll say amen. He changed the way he sees you. And if that's the case, you should change the way you pray for something. Instead of praying like, oh God, I hope this works. You should pray with the confidence that God is saying, now you're my light bearer. You should pray as though God is with you. And you'll find a greater level of success in your prayer when you don't feel like you're pleading with God or yelling at Him in a sense where you're saying, you know what? You've called me to represent the light you are. And that's why it works that way. So, seems simple enough, right? Seems simple enough. I think everybody would agree that we are now children of light. We're children of this gospel. So, to make light work, let's find out what light does. Okay, does, does light have a purpose? When Jesus said, I am the true light of this gospel, I am the source of life, does that mean something? Does it mean more than just flipping on a switch? I think it does. Let's look at three things tonight that show you what light can do so that when you begin to minister, you'll understand what you're doing. Because when Jesus called you light, that wasn't some, just a term, like, a, you know, like, hey, buddy, hey, bro, what's up? You know, like, it was not just a name. It had a lot of meaning behind it. And I was telling you, as you understand why he would use a word like that, which he continues to call you through the rest of the New Testament, and you know, he calls us saints, beloved, children of God. So tonight, I want you to remember one thing before we go to the next point. God calls you light. He calls you child of light. And light is a very specific word. Okay? So let's go to the second one. What does light do? First thing. This is going to sound simple. Light overcomes darkness. Is that fair? Light overcomes darkness. Now that's not hard to believe. Because when I come into the church room and the lights are off, I just look it on. Lights come on, it's not dark. It's not dark in here anymore. But does the Bible say that? It does. John chapter 1, verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Okay, that's New King James. But it also says it, it does not overcome it. Your translation may say it does not vanquish it, it cannot overcome it. Even New King James, what I've got here, says it can't overcome it. Darkness cannot overcome the light in you. When God said he who is in you is greater in this world, even though it's good to know that verse, it's even more key to understand why the enemy cannot overcome you. Sometimes as we minister, we're going to have confrontations with things that we may not have expected. So the first thing you should remember is, 
When you have light and God calls you light, you should be confident that darkness cannot overcome light. You tell me if I take a high a bulb or like a light and put it on a dark spot, what's going to change? That dark spot will come bright. So God wanted us to know that. And in a simple sense, we understand in this world, when there's darkness, light overcomes it. I'll share a story why that matters. See, right now you say, well, I know this is all very simple. Can I tell you very plainly, and we'll just be honest, a lot of believers I meet and people that are coming to know Jesus are walking around with frustrations. They're upset with God. They're upset with their life. They're upset with things that aren't working. I'll give you a story that makes this very clear. Years ago, I went to a church camp. Uh, and this church camp was in Forest Glen. It's up 45 north, all the way by Lake Travis. And uh, it was a weekend church camp. I got there Friday night. And I was told when you go to this camp, always keep a flashlight on you because it gets very dark. I thought, what well, y'all know? I'm from the city. I don't need a light. <laughs> so we went to the night service that first night, and I stuck around with a friend, and we ended up praying for hours at night. And he was going to sleep there on a couch. We found a place to hang out and pray. And he said, I'm just going to sleep on this couch. I said, I don't want to sleep on the couch. Let me go back to my cabinet. Well, it was late night, so sorry. It's about 2 in the morning or so. I thought, you know what? Let me go back to the cabin. I walked outside. It was so black, I couldn't see my hand. It went pitch black. I couldn't believe it. Matter of fact, I was a little scared. I said, oh my gosh, I can't see anything. When the morning came, the sun arose, and I just saw how amazing this camp was. You know, the camp was beautiful. It had a lake. It had uh, cabins. It had all these recreation centers. I mean, it had like a shooting range for like bows. I mean, it was fantastic. Because, you know, I grew up here in Pasadena area. I've never been out to the wilderness or forest. And it was just so amazing. It was so different than what I ever saw. But that was there the whole time. And when I came there, it was still dark. See, God's kind of clever. See, the sun arises and brings light to what we don't see. Now, I'm not talking about the sun in the sky. First Peter talks about when the day star arises in your hearts. Jesus Christ is like the day star. When he arises and he brings light to your life, what seemed dark and impossible is erased. Do you understand that? I think one of the reasons most Christians live in depression or frustration or loss is they don't see the light of the gospel in their life. They only can see this far. But when the sun arises and the color is brought back, black and white becomes day. And what seemed hopeless and lost and nowhere to go, the light overcomes it. See, God gave us such beautiful examples in this world, but we don't see it. We see the sun come up every day and go down. But when this true sun comes and arises on his throne, we still think we're hopeless. I'm telling you, there's no need to be depressed. God has taken his place on his throne. Jesus Christ reigns. But we have these examples in this world around us that show us that when light comes, everything's free. We can see where to go. So light overcomes darkness. It's the first point we should always remember about light. Second point. Light can guide us from darkness. First thing I said is light overcomes, from dark, overcomes darkness. Second point is light guides us. What do I mean? Luke chapter 1 verse 79. Now, the verse I have here. You remember Zacharias? He was the father of John the Baptist. Zacharias and Elizabeth, they were married but barren. And they were asking God for a child. And the angel Gabriel came and told them they would have a child. And his name would be John the Baptist. Zacharias didn't really believe him. And he was mute until it came time to name John. And Zacharias said his name is John. And his mouth opened supernaturally. And everybody was at all. Who is this, who is this baby? Who is this kid going to be? And the Spirit of God came upon Zacharias and began to prophesy about who John the Baptist would be. Now, this verse is the ministry of John the Baptist. But I believe it's not just for John, it's for us. He's, now, this is Zacharias talking about John. He says, John basically will give light to, to those who sit in darkness and in, in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. What am I saying? The gospel that John the Baptist was giving the people that time would not just save them from their sins, 
but it would also guide them on how to proceed. See, we as believers, I understand that we know the gospel in this house. But when you're saved, that doesn't mean it's the end of the road. Let's just say I free somebody from their sin, and they're free to leave this jail. Now what? I have so many places to go. And what's sad for me is, time and time again, when I minister to people, I can check on them after a month, and they, they're lost. They go right back where they started, and sometimes even back to the prison they came from. So when I told you that you carry light, you should remember not only does it, carry, does it overcome the darkness that are holding people, and even yourself, it is also a guiding tool to lead them in the right way. And I believe that's one of the make, biggest mistakes we have. We can't just pray for somebody and free them from an illness or a sin issue or forgiveness issue. It also has to guide them. And if you're not guiding somebody, you can't just free somebody and let them run loose. They don't know where to go. So what Zacharias was telling John the Baptist is, you aren't just going to preach repentance. You would guide them on the way to truth. Does it make sense? So light has more purpose. For example... If I walked in this church and I had one light on, I'm not sure where the other... I need a place to go. Light will guide my feet. Psalm 119, very famous verse, says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. So light has an ability to guide us. So even for ourselves, you may come to church. You may receive a great encounter from God. You may receive a touch from Jesus. Maybe you feel the anointing of God come on you. But if you're not seeking Jesus for that light to guide you, you may just end up where you started. And that's what I want to avoid. And I think that's why I have to spend more time on this. Because many people will believe me that light is overcoming darkness in their life. But then they stop. And they don't know where to go. So my challenge for you guys is don't just leave people hanging. Guide them. Give them a Bible. Keep a second Bible with you. If you're preaching the gospel to somebody, keep a throw down. Just, hey, read this word while you're at it. But freeing them isn't enough. I'm not saying I'm trying to play the God in their life, but the Bible calls us to baptize and to disciple. And if we're not discipling our friends or family or those that need to know God, then you're not finishing the job. You just let them loose out of the cage for them to go wherever they want to go. That's not right. That's why we have this understanding. So I told you light overcomes darkness, but also guides us. Not others, but also just also ourselves. It has to guide us. Next point that light can do, and this one gets really hard. I think it's going to be hard for many people to believe. Light exposes darkness. Light exposes darkness. Now you would think, that kind of already, you already covered that, didn't you? No. Jesus was never surprised by the sin of mankind. But we as believers express great shock when we begin to talk to somebody and say, hey, I spent the week doing this. That's where we drop the ball. When we carry light into someone's life, into someone's household, into our job, and we go there with the light of the gospel, and we show a light on their evil works, expect the worst. Don't be surprised if they respond by telling you something very crude, very lustful, very wrong, very blasphemous. You guys ever been like in a field and picked up an old piece of crate? like an old piece of board in the wood, and there's all those insects underneath, or something jumps out. That's kind of like exposing sin. Every time I pick up a board, you always wonder what's going to be under it, but it's been sitting on the grass for a long time. You may find something run away. That's what's happening when you bring light into someone's life. You will expose something in their life. You may very well find out something you never knew about the man. They may tell you I've been addicted to pornography for 30 years. You can't back off. And the reason the church is not being as effective as it should it is, is we just turn our back on them and say, that guy, I don't want anything to do with them. Did you hear what he said? And then we go gossip about it the next week. That's the worst part. Jesus never turned his back on anybody. When he faced the adulterer, adulteress, I'm sorry, he just stood with her. Those guys were trying to lambast her and say, why don't you stone her? He's like, why don't you throw a stone? I'm not throwing stones. He said, where'd your accusers go? He stuck it out with her. She was so touched because everybody else had cut her loose. And she's like, hey, you're still standing with me. He's like, I'm not offended by you. He wasn't shocked. When you bring the gospel, you should expect there to be some kind of frustration from them. Does that make sense? So we have to be ready 
to see what's going to happen and believe that the light of the gospel will make it go. It makes that darkness scatter. So when you are confronted to something that you don't want to hear, don't turn your back on them. Pick up the phone, call them again next week. Call them again. Hey, I didn't see you at church. Everything okay? You know, how's your week? Can I pray with you? Can I, I want to share something with you. Don't back out. But there's, a, there's another level of this. The Bible tells us in John chapter 3, verse 20, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. See, this is something else we should expect. People don't want the light of the gospel. The gospel in itself is offensive. We're telling people that there's only one way to heaven. People don't want to hear that. Nobody wants to hear that. You're telling me I'm going to go to no, I'm not saying go tell everybody to go to hell. But you know, when they start opening that Bible, they're going to see Jesus says, if you don't believe in me, you're condemned already. This is John chapter 3, right after 16, so God so loved the world. I think John 18, it's the same chapter. John 18 says, if you don't believe on me, you're condemned. But people will preach that. That's okay. I love God. But it was not God's heart to destroy them. But God hates the devil. He hates the work of the devil. And he does not want to see his children enslaved by that. So as you begin to preach the gospel to your friends and family, or you know, neighbors and co-workers, and they're like, I don't see a problem with that. It's okay. Don't worry about them. They've told you that they are addicted to it. You go to prayer and say, you spirit, whatever you are, get, leave that man alone. Get off him. Don't touch that marriage. Don't touch that child. I am keeping them innocent by the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't have power in them. You don't have power in them. See, Christ knew this was going to happen. In Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 13, it says, But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Now, if that doesn't make sense, I'll explain. It means God saying, this is how you expose issues. That verse says, this is how you expose it. God wanted this to expose it. Does it make sense? I'm not saying, go accuse people, go point the finger. God's saying, to expose the problems in our life, we need light. If you feel you're carrying a depression, a depression or a problem that's been going on, by, for going on for years, it's time to come to the light of the gospel. If you have a problem that won't leave you, and you're just like, man, I carry all these thoughts, and I don't like them, come to the gospel. The light that Jesus carries will expose it, and it will remove it. See, people are so afraid to come forward to God because they think he's going to shame him. Well, it's like, oh, he exposes me, I'm going to get called out. God isn't calling you out to embarrass you. He's calling you home, but he doesn't want that on you. So he's just saying, hey, it's time to let that go, son. Daughter, it's time to let that go. No more. We're, we're becoming adults. It's time to let that go. So God's saying, this is how you change. This is what God wants from us. I told you, we're talking about a ministry of reconciliation. And the light that we carry, even though it may be painful, will reconcile people to Christ. The salvation that you received, for some of us, didn't come easy. I don't know how many gospel testimonies we have in here. Some people say, I went to you know, a church camp and got saved. Mine was very difficult. And I'm not putting that on anybody. But we should realize that sometimes we're in a fight for people's lives. And it's not a game. It's not a game. There is a real enemy trying to take our family and our friends from God. And we've got to understand that we carry the same light that Jesus belongs to. The same one he embodied. I want to close with a story that I think we don't realize how important this is and how powerful this is. I'm going to close with a story. Acts chapter 26. There was a man named Saul. If he walked in this church right now, he would have shot me on the spot, drug some of the women to jail, and beat the rest of you. You know that? That's the, the guy that wrote the Bible would have barbed in this door and put his foot on my head. But that guy turned around. Turned around such that people consider him the greatest Christian. I'm, I'm not trying to raise up a man too far, but if you were to ask somebody who was the greatest New Testament man other than Jesus, most people would say Paul. Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament himself. He planted churches. He traveled the world that time. It said he got beaten, stoned, 
sat all night in the water. I don't know how that he did it. It's amazing. He was a unique man. But before he converted, he was a terror to people like us. We would have been afraid if he walked in the door. I would have bolted the door. So I said, Mark, hold the door. <laughs> but what do we see? Acts chapter 26, he begins to recount. He begins to retell his story. I want to show you how powerful this ministry of light is. While thus occupied, this is Paul talking, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Let me recount that story. Saul was on his way to go kill more Christians to make them blaspheme, and a great light appeared on his journey. A light so bright that he said he fell off. Now, we've been talking about light, and you're saying, man, am I being hyperbolous? No. The light of Jesus Christ shone on Saul and turned one of the most wicked men in the Bible into the most powerful man in the Bible, in my estimation. The same ministry I'm telling you tonight touched a man who was murdering Christians and burning people in churches and turned them around into the Paul that you read about. When I told you about this ministry of light, you may have thought I was being casual. It's the same ministry you saw here. Jesus appeared as what? A great light. And then not just to stop there, let's look. He says, in order to open their eyes, verse 18, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to what? To light. He said, not only will I do it to you, you'll make other people light. Right? And says to deliver them from the power of Satan to God. So there's more to what I told you tonight. And I really have to think about how to make this message. Because I could have gone on. Light has so many aspects. And you are a scientist. Light has a lot of laws about its speed, its power, its effects. God did not use this word casually. And when he appeared to Saul, it said he was brighter than the sun. Our God is the most powerful God. There is no other God. There is no other Lord. There is no other King other than Jesus Christ. And Saul got a glimpse of it. And it said it knocked him off his horse and changed his life. You know that light I'm talking about in that story is in each of you right now? You have to believe it to make it happen. If you believe in a state that God is not with me, God is not powerful, it may be very difficult to do this. But if you're willing to stand with me in prayer, I'm telling you that same ministry is in each of you. It's in you. Jesus Christ is in you. The hope of glory. He's in you right now. We have this story to reference the power of the gospel. That we can preach the gospel. And you may not have to see it with your eyes. But there is a war in the spirit. When you begin to share the gospel. And you're praying in the back of my Lord. Open this person's ears. I don't want them to be condemned. I don't want them to go down this road. The light of the gospel in you is shining on all that evil. And you're taking them from the kingdom of Satan and its power. To the kingdom of our God. You have to realize you are ministers. You've been given the power of salvation. You have resurrection power in you, and you are ministers of light. You have it. You've been sitting on gold. There are people in here that are still waiting for a touch from God. Can I tell you, you're sitting on invaluable treasure already. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, it says. It's in you. So as I close in prayer, I'm going to ask you to just put down whatever boundaries in front of you. Whatever is told you you're not able to minister Whatever is able told you that you're not called to preach or teach or to pray, let's just wipe that off the table. Let's just say we just erase all that and start over. Let's say you've never heard any other message and this was the first time you came to church. I want you to believe, you know what? That's right. 
God is light. Jesus is the true light. And he said, I am the light of the world. The ministry that Jesus had for us is now moved into me, and I am God's ambassador, and now I carry that light. And when I pray for people, the light of Jesus Christ is shining on them. And whether or not they fall over, it doesn't matter. I know in their hearts, I am exposing something that will run from me. Because light has to overcome darkness. Let's just begin to pray together. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for this word. I thank you, Lord God, because you're setting people free. Lord, tonight, God, I want to break out anything that's holding them back. Lord, there has been depression operating in too many believers tonight. We want to break that out. God, today, turn the lights on. Show them the joy of the Spirit of God. Renewing them that joy. Renewing them a steadfast heart and faith. Lord, let it be a renewing of their mind. That people are saying, my life has been one problem to the next. Lord, turn the lights on. Let them see the beauty of the gospel. The beauty of Jesus Christ who redeemed them. Lord, I pray the Spirit of God just turn that around. Whatever is touching them, whatever is hurting them. Lord, let the gospel and the light and the power of your name expose that darkness. And let every power of the devil break. Every snake just flee out of their lives. Everything that's harassing them has to turn and run. Because God says, darkness cannot overcome my light. Lord, if there is a situation in their life where they want to show that light, and they don't feel equipped, remind them that their new identity is in you. If that bulb is flickering, and they don't feel like they know Jesus Christ, God, renew that relationship tonight. Renew it tonight. Connect them back to show them that your name is on them. And finally, Lord, open the doors. Open those doors, Lord God. Give them opportunity to minister this way. This week, God, I'm asking you to pray. Tell God, this week, I want to minister like this. Tell him he will do it this week. Before you leave out of this house, you may have a phone call where somebody needs you to touch them. I cannot touch everybody, but you can. Lord, open those doors. This week, Lord God, let them have an opportunity to minister and remind them. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will remind you of what Jesus told you. And Jesus told you, I am the true light of this world. Go and minister. And let the light of the gospel, and just in your heart, when you begin to talk to them about Jesus, say, Lord, let the light of God open their hearts. You will see blind eyes open, I promise. Lord, I thank you for this word. I thank you for this house. I thank you, Jesus, for doing a mighty work. God, touch them. Bless them for coming. Bless them. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen.